beginning before World War II. Already by 1916, 12,000 of the 50,000 workers in the Chicago stockyards, for example, were African American. Just to give you an example of the volume of, of this movement to these two cities. And by the 1920s, Detroit had 40,000 African uh, Americans who had migrated into uh, the city. The growth in the numbers of black workers whether in Chicago or Detroit, often provoked hostility among white workers. White industrialists hired black workers to tighten their control over white workers who threatened to strike for higher wages or better working conditions. Black men did on occasion cross picket lines, and on other occasions they found solidarity with white workers. Henry Ford, as early as 1919, formed a patron-client relation, relationship with black ministers, such as Reverend Robert L. Bradby of the Second Baptist Church. In return for financial contributions to the church, Reverend Bradby vouched for prospective employees who were, quote, reliable, compliant, and decidedly anti-union. <laughs> Patronage relationships between black and white leaders differ in Chicago somewhat. A more nuanced relationship existed between philanthropist Julius Rosenwald, who was the founder of Sears Robot, and the black community. For example, Rosenwald intervened when the YMCA refused to admit black men. He provided financial support to black Chicagoans to build their own downtown YMCA branch. Black people raised $50,000, and Julius Rosenwald contributed $25,000 to build a new Wabash YMCA. It opened in 1913. Why is this important? What does this have to do with the black Chicago Renaissance? Well. In September of 1915, Carter G. Woodson, historian, founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History and thus launched a century-long black history movement dedicated to writing and teaching the history of black people in America and across the African diaspora. The Black Chicago, the, or the Black History Movement, proved to be one of the strongest force, one of the strongest forces in the intellectual life of Black Chicago. The Black History Movement was like the lifeblood, intellectually speaking, to the Black people in that city. The timing was propitious. By the 1920s, over 70,000 black Americans had made it to Chicago. By the end of World War II, there were, in Chicago, 15 Negro history clubs that met at the Dr. George Cleveland Hall Branch Library and at a nearby school with attendance exceeding over 800 individuals at each meeting. Uh, who was responsible for all of that? Librarian, Vivian Harsh. Vivian Harsh spearheaded the organizing of the Negro History Clubs and the reading groups. According to one scholar, quote, the Negro History Clubs were in fact the largest clubs at any of the libraries during the war years, or during the years before the war. A premier poet of the Black Chicago Renaissance, Langston Hughes, wrote a poem entitled Dawn, which succinctly captures the reasons why so many Americans in the 1920s quit the South and headed north. 
and said, I'm gonna, you can't have a renaissance without talking about Langston Hughes or quoting one of his poems. I mean, it doesn't matter what side of the country you live on. You have to quote Langston Hughes. So this is the gone poem. I am fed up with Jim Crow laws, people who are cruel and afraid, who lynch and run, who are scared of me and me of them. I pick up my life and take it away on a one-way ticket, gone west, gone. Now, 